All right, guys, welcome to the channel. Welcome to the buildup of Will's race truck. Will, I'm looking you kind of straight today. <laughs> this is not your normal height. Well, you know, sometimes it feels good to grow five inches overnight. Yes, that's a good way to go right there. Crowd. So Todd hijacked my project a little bit and he yeah. said, hey, we need to test our fuel system and turbos because this is a bone stock truck with 410,000 miles. So yeah. anybody's truck out there should run very similar to this if it's stock. Oh yeah. And we got these new turbos we're coming out with. I haven't released them yet, but basically long story short is we have a very popular turbo called the K27. It's been a great turbo. I love it. Biggest problem is Borg Warner doesn't make it in America. They make it in Brazil. Brazil is where they come from. And it's... We can never get them. We have like a bunch and they're gone for six months. And it's been a real supply issue of getting it. It's a good turbo. It's, it's a definite nice upgrade to a stock turbo, but man, it's hard. To get but it doesn't them. matter if we order 10 or 500. It seems like we get the same amount yeah. delivered. And so frustrating. And so guys like you can't have a nice turbo. So what, so, are, what are we, what are we working so we've on? So we've been working on some modified stock turbos. You know, the Borg Warner is just a drop in. It's their version of the HX35. That's the K27. So we're taking some whole sets and we're going to modify them and we're going to test them out here and see if they're better or not. And so I mean, one of the cool things is we're using the HE351 wheel in these turbos. Now this, that wheel is like the king of all 60 millimeter wheels. Like nothing's ever come close to it. Yeah. Right? You talk to any turbo engineer at Borg, Garrett, Rotomaster, whoever, yeah. they say that is like one of the best home runs whole sets ever hit. That 351 wheel. That HE351 60 millimeter wheel, which is kind of modeled after the Super HX40 six blade wheel, but mm -hmm. it's a seven, so it's quiet and uh, it just, Flow. it's a full monster. Didn't Meyer hit like dang near 700 horsepower on that wheel on the, on the Northwest dyno circuit? Yeah, I mean, there's guys, you know, when everything's tuned perfect with the right flow, they're getting up there almost 700. I mean, that might have been a healthy correction factor, but still, it's ridiculous high. It's ridiculous high. So, so we are gonna put in that wheel in the HX35 with a stock turbine wheel and some different turbine wheels, and we're gonna test it out and see if we can't find an affordable replacement for the, for the K27. Then we're also gonna do some little bit bigger hot rod stuff too, our Super 9s, we call it. We're gonna play with those as well. So maybe that's kind of like a, a hybrid, right? Yeah, it's kind of a hybrid custom turbo, and the whole reason for the Super 9 is in the past testing and stuff we've done, they seem to work really well. Yeah. Like the giveaway truck has, has a Super, a Super 9. 9. I mean, and it's supporting a thousand horsepower in a compound setup. And it spools like stock. It spools really I mean, good. I hate to say it, but I mean, the thing just comes right on the turbo. So anyway, so we're going to play with a bunch of turbos on here, maybe just one or two right away and some fuel. Yep. And then after Todd's done playing wimpy 500 horsepower, whatever this is, then this truck is going to become a dedicated race truck. And I got a race coming in three months. So this has got to happen quick. Yes. Well, we're gonna do this quick. So right away, as we're gonna do the fuel system, we're gonna put like a 550 horsepower fuel package on here. That should be enough fuel for 550 horsepower. We're gonna see how close each turbo can come to that. We're gonna do spool up time, EGT. So control they're all testing. gonna have the same fuel package, right? Yep. No fuel setting's not gonna change. So just getting a 550 fuel package with an AFC Live, so we can play a little bit of the fuel, but for the most part, it's probably gonna be max fuel is gonna make max yeah. power, and it's just basically a back-to-back -back turbo test yeah. on a stock engine yes on an engine that's out there in the street so we're gonna get the best 500 horsepower turbo available in this testing it's gonna be super fun so make sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss these tests give us a like and uh, i think are we gonna do anything what? with the head bolts or anything or just send it should maybe we put some one of our head bolt kits in there maybe well maybe we'll, we'll maybe we'll do this this well the stock hx35 will leave the stock head bolts because that, that's a 350 horsepower we know that 360 on a good day and um so that's probably fine for there, but going up, we may want to do that. When we get to 500, I don't think the stock head bolts is a good idea. Cool. Let me play the fire. So anyway, we're going to get started right now and start tearing this thing apart, and it's going to be awesome. Okay, so Todd and I made a little plan off camera. Maybe it's off camera. He may have got it. We'll see. He might have filmed that. I don't know. <laughs> but basically, I'm going to start tearing this apart because 
We're over in a new little cubby shop next to Power Driven. Yep. And we don't have any parts here. So Todd's <laughs> gonna run and get the parts. I'm gonna start ripping this thing apart. And we're gonna put this fuel package on right now. It's gonna be awesome. Here we All right, pro tip, this little vanity cover is annoying. You have to reach clear under the cowl, get your hand in insulation to do this, and it bites you. After removing this about four times, when you progress in your hot routing 12 valve Cummins career, you throw these things away. There, this is a proper looking 12 valve. Guys, when you're taking the lines off, if you leave all six of them bolted together, clamped together, they go on and off way easier. And there's room, if you get your wrench just right, to put these. If you take all these little clamps off, it's really hard to get the lines back straight and running true, so better off to just take them all off. Guys, when you're working on trucks, it's nice to tuck this over so it's out of your way, this upper radiator hose. But I guarantee you, if you do that at some point in your career, you will forget about it, start the truck, and the fan will eat this belt. I've probably lost five or 10 of these <laughs> over my career of working on these things. So it's convenient, but it's also dangerous. Proceed at your own risk. Okay, so when you pull this off as a kit, just make sure this stuff's out of the way. And if some of them hang, just turn them out a little bit. They should come right off as an assembly. Look at that. Beautiful, that'll bolt right on way easier next time. So. All right, dude, I am back with Mega Parts. I've probably bought, got more than I should have, but you know, you start walking around the aisle, it's like, oh, I need one of those, I need one of those. So this may be a two-part installment speaker, but I got the, you know, 60 pound springs, probably not needed for this, but I mean, you're here anyway, so I mean, you know, we should do that. I got the little tools so we can put the springs on, make it easy. Cool. Oh, what else I got here? I got the head bolt kit. Okay, so I was thinking about it, like, we're in here this deep anyway. It'd be stupid to come back and do it later. So if we think we need it, we should just do it now. So I got the head bolt kit. That's uh, somebody's vitamin water. Gloves, I like gloves. So I got gloves for me. Um, let's see here. Oh, this goes. Ahead. This is a tool for the head bolt kit. Governor Springs, Governor Spring tool. Is, is, Anything about that? Yeah, we yes. need the Governor Spring tool. Um, AFC Live. While we're in here, let's put the AFC foot in there so we don't have to waste our time in that modifying, modifying crap. 400,000 mile AFC. You need AFC housing new, too. New yeah. rebuild kit, we're gonna rebuild the AFC, make things that's awesome. You were talking about your bell crank bushings and how the TPS sucks in this thing. Yeah, it hunts for overdrive. It hunts for overdrive because the TPS sucks. Oftentimes it's just a bell crank bushing. So we're gonna put these things in, probably solve that hunting for overdrive issue. Um, timing, we got the timing gear puller and our timing wheels so we can bump timing up here for sure. We need that. What, what are we going to take it to, you think? 18, don't you think it's about for 500, 550 horsepower? Sure, that'd be good for speed. Yeah, uh, help us out. I got the, our 5x12 injectors here. These all come with the install kit, so all our coppers and washers are here. And I got us a puller so we don't jack them up, pull them out of there. We're not going to vice grip out the threads on this one. It's going to be great. 400,000 mile injectors, they might not come out without a puller. Yeah, so I want the puller for sure. Uh, I figured for these little turbos, a boost up was nice enough. We don't need a turbo tuner necessarily at this level. So I thought this is a very simple way to up our boost. We can do that with this guy right here, boost elbow. 
Oh, O2-5 delivery valves. Give us some more fuel in that pump. That'd be awesome. While we're in there setting timing, I got us a new pin in case that one's missing or broken or something. I figure 4,000 miles. While we're in here, I don't want to run back over to the shop and grab them. These are so cheap. It's just like... It's a pump timing kit. Pump timing yeah. kit. Yep. And then our max travel kit. We're going to need to have that AFC slow down a little bit with our extra fuel. So, so, that, so that's our bag of parts or box of parts, I guess, is more accurate. So there's one thing we need that you forgot. Oh, crap. I just look... As I pulled oh, this off and they're weeping, valve I like, cover gaskets. we need some valve cover gaskets. Bad. All right. I'll go grab some of those, too. All right, Will, I came back and I got some more crap too. Because you know, that's what you do when you go to get stuff. All right, so first off, I decided to get, well, we need one of these. I'm not sure if you had to deliver a DV socket here in your toolkit or not. So I stole that from Tony. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, I got the boot kit, because I just, those look so crusty. I'm like, you know what, it's not a big deal. You should put them on here. And um, so I got the boot kit. With, the, with our super clamps. These things. So we're planning to take this turbo testing to high levels of boost? You never know how it goes. Maybe 45, 50 pounds? If we can, yeah. What's well, interesting, you probably knew this, but I, I, Tony never told me, and I didn't know because I don't do stock boots very much. There's a different angle on these two. One's passenger and one's driver. So the, the passenger one has a much uh, less. Has more angle. Yes, has more angle. And the, so I just thought I'd just get a 45 degree angle, but it's totally not going to work. So. The different angles, so we got the right boots, one for the driver side and one for the passenger side. So it should go on good. I got the gasket for you. Now, what are these boots rated for? Do you know any vehicles that No have one has blown them up boot? yet. No one has blown them up yet. <laughs> we got the valve cover gaskets and then I got the intake horn gasket. So, yeah, Perfect. 140 pounds of boost is what these are rated for so far. They ha we haven't blown it up. 145. 140, you're 145. My gosh. So these are holding up on the junker at 145 pounds of boost. I think they'll work out okay on the single turbo testing, but those are, I mean, if those have 400,000 miles on them, let's just replace them. They might have, sometimes they rub on the inner fender, remember, too. Oh, yeah. The so they might be getting so weak. They might even have holes in it right now. Yeah. We'll see when we take them off. Okay. Keep cracking. And it came off, but it was harder than the rest of them. So everything we do on number six is going to be harder than anything we do on one through five. I don't know why it has to be that way. And that is totally effective life, for sure. All right, injector puller tool. This is a very, this is a very simple tool. It takes pulling injectors a, a breeze. So if you, if, if you put them fresh, you can pull them out by hand. These have been here a long time, not coming out by hand. Some guys will grab the threads with vice grips, channel locks, and they send them back in for a core refund, and we cannot refund it if these threads are boogered up. Sometimes they'll grab the flats here. There's a on the side of the injector, there's a, a, a fuel return. If they if they put marks in this, we cannot give them a full core refund. So if you're gonna get seven injectors, do yourself a favor, get this simple little tool. Works really well, nothing's fancy about it. And you will be able to get a full core refund on your some injectors rather than us saying, sorry, your injectors are junk. You should have used something to, oh, this is a first gen one, sorry. So this is a, this is a first gen nut and a second gen nut. There's two different sizes in the, in the kit, depending on the first gens have a smaller thread or a smaller pitch or diameter. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> COVID cough, there it is. Okay, three. So just tighten her down. Up she comes, inject her out. Save yourself a ton of headache and nasty stuff. And then it just comes off. Some people might say I'm a wuss because I wear gloves, and Will's a real man because he's got dirty hands. Since you're a real man, could you give this a little tug and break it loose nice and firm so the barrel doesn't move? Goodness gracious. But I will say, you go to any mechanic shop anywhere, they're wearing gloves. Same. Two hours later. Hey, look at these sissy gloves here. <laughs> we don't need that where we're going. Freaking Todd. You know how you hide gloves from Todd? Hide them in the toolbox, he'll never find them. This one. <laughs> we're not a mechanic shop, we're a race shop. That's very different. 
Ooh. We're ready for you, Mr. Muscles. Mr. Muscles. It's good firm. We don't want the barrel turning. Got it. No movement. Why do we not want the barrels turning? Tell the folks why. You got to do a good firm pull because the barrel can turn. If the barrel turns, that changes the orientation of the barrel to the plunger, which affects when it starts injecting fuel and how much, the quantity. It's not good. So here's the old injectors. I got them all out now. When you pull injectors out, make sure you see a copper washer come out with your injector. We're gonna put new ones back in. So, you know, sometimes these will be stuck or in the bottom of the, of the thing, of the hole. It's not hard to get it back out. Just make sure you don't put two washers in there. Don't leave this one in there and then put another one on top of it. So all of my injectors have their washers with it. So we're good to go. He's ready to see this action, magnet. This factory DV, this is 180 horsepower. You probably can't see. It says 052 181. So people call these a 181 delivery valve. Pretty simple. All right, so this is the stock 181 delivery valve. This is the power driven 025. You can see the seats are different. The seat's not where the magic happens. The only thing that magical about the seat is some guys see this and they'll put these ones in upside down. So this is the bottom and this is the bottom. Don't flip those around. The magic is right here. The shoulder of the delivery valve controls how much fuel comes out of it. This valve has to open further before this shoulder clears that and lets full fuel come out of these flutes. The 025 delivery valve has a narrow shoulder. That's where the magic happens, where we're picking up that 25 to, um, kind of depends on, on the pump, but you can pick upwards of 60 cc's of fuel. Guys that don't speak fuel, that could be almost 100 horsepower if you have enough air behind it. So that's the magic of an 025 delivery valve. All right, guys, we're gonna do delivery valves next. Now there's one mistake or problem a lot of guys have if you have a 94 or 95 model year pump, injection pump, so a 160 or a 175 horsepower pump, or if you have a newer truck and maybe somebody swapped a different pump in there, there's a little steel shim that goes underneath the factory delivery valve that you do not want to reuse. We want to pull that out. So it's coming a little tighter here. And I'll show you in the pump right where the steel shim is. And which one do you want to get on right here? So you see where my pick is pointing? Down on top of that, that is the actual barrel. And on top of that, there'll be a little shim. So you wanna look and make sure there's not a shim there. If there is, you need to pull it out and throw it away. Then your new delivery valve, this big side goes down. So these are 025 delivery valves and they just drop down just like that. And these are clean from power driven. So you don't have to, but you can clean them off if you want, but we package them pretty clean. Drop them right there in the pump. Really easy to change delivery valves. Okay, so we're gonna take these O-rings off the delivery valve holders. 
and install the new ones that came provided with the delivery valves. So a little pick works great just to get that thing started and then you just roll it off. Like that. And I like to spray these off with a little bit of brake cleaner. And the new O-ring, just roll it on like this. And if you want, you can look in here and see if your pump has had any rust or anything in it. And if this falls out, it's not the end of the world. This is just a little spring seat. It's got a couple of shims on it. Just put the shims back in. Put that on, goes right back in just like that. Now that needs to go right on the tip of the delivery valve. So like on an old one here, see the top of the delivery valve? This spring ends up going just like that. And then this compresses down and seats right on the top of that when you install it. So after you clean it off, I like to take a little shot of WD-40, just because I like to lube that O-ring a little bit. You can use oil, whatever. I just want use grease if you're like a real pump shop, but a little oil is all we need. And let's go over here and put this on the truck. So then I just hold the spring with my finger and let it kind of fall short distance onto the delivery valve. I fish it so it's on the top of the little valve. And then you just thread it in by hand. And you're watching this O-ring get crushed down in as it slowly works its way in, make sure it doesn't get pinched. And it kind of popped and went, I could feel it with hand. All right, so now that we got all the delivery valves installed, now we gotta torque them. The first step is to take them all to 25 foot-pounds. This just kind of seats them in, makes sure everything's straight. So don't go over, 25 is all we're doing. If they go to 34. Now in one motion, you want to go right to 84. So a click type torque wrench is actually better for this. You just got to be on your game with this, otherwise you're going to over torque it. You can split the seat if you over torque the delivery valve. I guess you could pull the threads out of the barrel too if you're really, really rambunctious. Six to 88 was my range. Not, not, not bad for freehand. All right, those are all cleaned up and good. Now we wanna do valve spring? Yeah. All right guys, we're gonna do the valve springs now because the injectors are out. Uh, we're doing a whole lot to this engine. Let me just pull injectors out and put them back in. But when the injectors are out, the engine bars over really easily because it doesn't have to compress all that air. Now there's a cool tool, an engine barring tool you can buy that goes down in the adapter plate that'll turn the, uh, the flex plate, I guess it is. I mean, if you have a, it's just a flex plate. It'll turn that and it'll turn the engine over really easy, but it's kind of a pain to get down there. So if you have a 7 8 socket on a wrench, you can put this on your alternator pulley right here, and you can turn the engine over backwards. So you're gonna be lo like you're loosening the bolt. As you do this, it rotates the engine over backwards. You know, the engine's moving easily. There's nothing, no injector, so it's nice. 
So there's lots of different ways to hold your valves in place. Um, if your piston's down in its stroke and you take off the locks and keepers and retainers, this valve is gonna fall down into the cylinder, which is a big mess, so you gotta take your head off. You don't wanna do that. Some guys make cool contraptions where they're gonna pressurize air into the hole and that'll hold the valves up and they're against their seats and that works cool. Uh, for me, it's much easier just to make sure I have the piston at top dead center in its respective hole and then I can just let the valves fall on top of the piston and you have no issues. So how do you find if what piston's at top dead center? Well, with this engine going this way, the engine's going backwards. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna watch your intake valves. You're gonna look for one that's coming up. So it's going number one here. <clears throat> so we're gonna wait for number one. We're gonna watch number one intake valve. And it's gonna go down. And this is the intake, this is the exhaust. Very good, yep, thank you. Well, some people don't know yeah, that. absolutely. Well I'm, well, I'm glad you said it. Okay, intake's going down. So we're not there yet. All right, starting to come back up. I'm slowing down, I'm watching this come back up. Now I'm watching the exhaust valve. When that exhaust valve starts to move. Oh, okay, just I moved. Just saw it. Okay, these are both now moved. So this is an overlap, so this piston is now at top dead center. Now, the Cummins has companion cylinders. One and six, two and five, three and four are together. So if this one's at top dead center, that one is also at top dead center not relative to the cam, but it's at the top of the, of the cylinder. So you can do one and six at the same time, two and three at the same time, three and four at the same time. Some people and, say- And this is technically not a top dead center of the opposite. compression stroke. Yes. But number six actually is, is. Yes, but the pistons are both at the top of their stroke in different, you know, relative to the cam timing, all that kind of stuff. So now we can take this guy off and these guys will just sit right on top. If you're nervous and you want to verify, find something skinny to poke down the hole, you can be able to fill that piston. There it is, I've hit the piston. So I know that this is a top dead center, so now the valves will sit right on top of that. So let's pull that, we gotta pull this head bolt out. While we're doing that, we might as well replace it with our new head bolts. Yep. It wasn't very tight. <laughs> yeah, you start some of these old trucks, they're not super tight. All right, what are we doing right now is we're going to replace the stock valve springs with the upgraded 60 pound valve springs. These are stiffer, uh, they can handle more RPM. Uh, what we're also doing is replacing the stock retainer and locks. So this, this here is the stock piece, for one it's very heavy, and it's a very soft metal, and this are the actual pieces that hold the valve in. They're quite small. Um, let's compare them to what we're gonna replace them with. This is the stock piece hardware. This is what we're replacing it with. So much heavier duty, much stronger. And the reason we wanna do this is that as you get more and more RPM, these will start to actually pull through. These little guys will sit in here. And the valve will actually start pulling it, we're pulling it down further and further and further, it'll pull through. It'll actually crack these bases here. These are, these are, or these retainers. They're just, they're junk. Well, they're great, 400,000 miles, they're not junk. They're great for their intended purpose. <laughs> but when you start increasing RPM, they are not designed for that. So what we've done is- Many guys, like even me on my junker, I ran these with 60 pound springs, got a little over 3,500 RPM, and mine were spider cracked, and I had s several of these that they were just about to drop. And if you drop a valve at RPM, you're munching a piston, cylinder yeah. wall. I mean, guys have windowed blocks from drop valves. So. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's really a mess. So we come up with this chromoly retainer here, 
And so this is a much lighter weight, much stronger material. It's a heat-treated chromoly. Yeah, it's awesome. And obviously with the much stronger locks, uh, we don't have any issues with these things pulling through and, and breaking. So this is a much more modern uh, valve retainer and lock setup, and it's awesome. And honestly, this is the most affordable valve spring setup. It's not the highest performance, but for most guys, I mean, this, this is by far the best bang for your buck out there. So anyway, we're going to put these in this truck here, then we can have confidence as we rev it up. It's going to be great, and um, yes, yeah, so let's get after it. Great time to change your valve stem seals, but let's be honest, Papasaurus is going to have a race engine pretty soon. So. put that new head bolt in there. All right, since we're not gonna be putting the stock head bolts back in, we're gonna do the power driven upgraded head bolts. Um, this is just, it's a nice replacement. You got longs and shorts. These will be the long ones because this is the uh, rocker tower. So this is the longest bolt in here. Brand of lube there. This is ARP lube, lots of it. So you can do a good job. So we're gonna lube up the threads real nice. I'm also going to lube underneath the head of the bolt. There's a lot in here for the, you should have plenty to do this job with some to spare, honestly. I'm going to do underneath this underside of the bolt here so it doesn't have any friction. And then she's ready to go in. Now, this is a socket cap bolt. And at 125 foot pounds, your typical chromie is probably not up to the task. You may get through a set, you may break a chromie. So we offer this nice tool you can get with the kit here. This is a nice head bolt socket. So you can option this if you buy the head bolt pack, and this will be a, this will get you through the no problem. Very strong tool. That's it, that'll hold the power for that particular bolt. We gotta replace the rest of them, but it's that, that simple, one at a time.
right now that we got the valve springs and the head bolts installed we need to redo the valve lash generally whenever you put a higher strength fastener in the engine it crushes the head gasket down a little more which will tighten up the valve lash now on an old truck like this one we're working on 410,000 chances are the valve lash was too loose to begin with so if anything it makes it closer to spec but since we're gonna kind of hot rod this on the dyno a little bit I want to make sure that we're set at 10 and 20. So on a cold engine, you want the intakes at 10 thousandths. You want the exhaust at 20. What we need is, is literally five tools for that. We need a 10 thousandths feeler gauge, a 20 thousandths feeler gauge, a screwdriver to turn the uh, adjuster on the rocker arm. We need a 14 millimeter wrench to uh, turn the, the lock nut. And then we need a 7 8 socket on a ratchet that we're going to turn the alternator. Now we still have the uh, Injectors are removed, so the engine's gonna bar over really easy. That's why I'm doing it right now. We're gonna do this the same thing Todd told us earlier in the video, um, where you want companion cylinders. So I'm gonna turn the engine over with the alternator. It will only turn over in reverse. We're looking for uh, an intake valve to come up right as an exhaust valve, so valve overlap. So when we see that on a cylinder, we're gonna know it's companion cylinders at top dead center where we can set the valve lash safely. Now there's other methods in the Cummins manual on how to do half the cylinders, bar the engine 180 from TDC and do the other half. And all of that works on stock trucks, the stock cam. When you start working on race trucks with higher lift cams, you learn that that Cummins method does not work and you can't set your lash. So we train all the guys and mechanics at our shop to do it the companion cylinder way. That way you're definitely on the base circle of, of whatever cylinder you're setting the lash and you never ever have screwed up lash. Let's get to it. So first, I'm just gonna bar the engine over. We're just looking for a companion cylinder. Okay, so back here in number six, I can see the uh, intake valves coming up. As soon as the exhaust valve starts to go down, right there. Now I know I can safely do the lash on cylinder number one because one and six are companion cylinders. Any two cylinders that add up to a total of seven is a companion cylinder. So now I can do the lash on number one. You see both of these are loose. You can't do the lash on that one because they're in overlap. So all the lash is gone essentially. So intake. We're actually spot on there. And it was probably at 12 thousandths before, but since we added the head bolts, it tightened down the gasket. It probably tightened up this lash. So that one's intake's perfect. Let's check the exhaust. Exhaust just fine. I mean, it might be about 20 and a half thousandths, but I'm not going to mess with it for this. So now let's go to the next cylinder. So number one's fine. Okay, it looks like this intake's coming up. So as soon as that one goes into overlap, that means we can do number four. Okay, so now number three is an overlap. We can now do cylinder number four. 20. Good. So that one's a little bit loose. I'd say it's about 12. So we're just going to loosen this adjuster here. Put our failure gauge in. We just go till it's tight. You still want to be able to slide this, but you want some decent friction. Okay, so right there, we're there. Now we're going to hold this, tighten the adjuster pretty easy. We're just holding the screw so it doesn't turn. Perfect. The so one and four are done. Let's watch for the next companion cylinder. Okay, so it looks like number five intake starting to come up. Right there, intake came up, exhaust started going on five. Five plus two is seven, so I know this one is the companion cylinder. If the head was off, both of these pistons would be all the way up. This one's an overlap, this one's at top dead center of this cylinder. So now we can check the lash on it. Check the exhaust, 20, good and tight. That one's probably 19 and a half, it's close enough for what we're doing. That one's pretty loose. In fact, I wonder if a 20 will go in there. It felt really loose. Ooh, a 20 will almost go in that intake. It's way loose.
Okay, so we've done cylinder one, two, and four. Let's keep going and see the next cylinder that goes in over that. Looks like number one is coming up. This looks like number six is gonna be the next one. Exhaust is perfect on six. Intake's a little loose. It's about, I'd say 11 thousandths. Cylinder six runs a little hotter, so I'm just gonna leave it. It's too hard to work back there anyway. <laughs> okay, so one, two, four, and six are done. So it looks like number four is coming up. So the next one we're gonna be able to do is number three. Now number three is an overlap, or four is an overlap. That means we do number three. Three plus four is seven. Simple math. That one's a little loose. An intake, we'll have to adjust that. Exhaust, just right. on there just slide the rocker arm out to the edge of the perfect okay so remember we've done one two and three now and six looks like number two Intake's coming up, so number five is going to be the next cylinder. We're in overlap, so now we're on number five. Five is good. Look, the next one coming up is number six. That's where we started. So six is an overlap. We come back and double check our work on number one. If you're really thorough, like your race truck, you'll just double check them after you bar the engine over, just to make sure. Next one coming up is three. That means number four is the next one, just like we did before. and 20 perfect all right last is set let's put the injectors in now all right guys we're going to install the injectors now we commonly get questions what thickness of washer should you use factory first generation cummins have these thick washers Factory 215 horsepower trucks have these thin washers. They're about 20 thousandths. And most uh, 180 horsepower trucks, like this one was 96 automatic, they came with a medium. The difference is this kind of changes how deep the injector sits down into the engine bore a little bit. Generally, we found if you run a lot of timing, you want to run these thin washers. The downside is if your old head is cracked or you don't get the injector bores very clean, these don't seal as well. So usually we tell guys run the mediums because they're easier to seal. One and two, if you have cracks, they don't burn out as easy as these ones. If you're uh, going to turn up the timing a lot, then definitely you want to run these thinner washers because they get the injector deeper in the bowl, which allows it to have more timing and still spray correctly into the piston. Since this is just a 550 horse fuel package and we're not cranking the timing to the moon, we're going to go with the medium washers. Ok, 
Okay, sometimes it's hard to keep these copper washers from falling when you tip them down in the cylinder. So a little bit of grease, or this is some sort of silicone grease, but regular engine grease works just fine. Put a little bit on there. And that'll hold this washer in there because it kind of suctions on there. See, now it stays there. Now you can drop this in the hole without the washer falling. Ball side goes out. There's a little detent in the cylinder head down in there that lines up. And, uh, you know, this hole goes that way. Pretty easy. Drop her straight down. Take your hold down nut. I like to thread them down finger tight first and then come back with the wrench. That way you can make sure the injector is seated. I like to go to 42 foot pounds on the ejector hold downs. I think the spec's 38 or something like that, but 42 is what I've always done. Alright, now that we've got the injectors installed, let's work on the AFC housing and get an AFC Live and AFC foot installed on this injection pump. And uh, we'll also need to do the governor springs, so we're going to show you how to get the factory governor springs out and install a, a 4K governor spring kit. we got to take this factory feed line off so that we can get at the tamper screws on the AFC easier, since we've got a grind on it. And we got all this access here. Okay, to get the AFC housing off, the shutdown solenoid has a bracket on top of it. This just pivots out of the way. If this is too tight, there's an eight millimeter bolt underneath here that, that's too tight and won't let this pivot, but this one, I'm just gonna force it. There. So now I got enough, I can get the AFC housing out. There it is, the AFC is out.
All right, you don't want to drop anything inside the injection pump, governor housing, that's anything below this. This is the fuel plate we're pulling out. You use an impact screwdriver to break it loose, but you want to be very careful not to drop that split washer in there, or you got to fish it out with a magnet or pull the pump, because it will blow up the governor housing eventually if you lose anything in there. Looking at the hole, it looks like the fuel plate is in the factory position. See how it's kind of centered on the plate? If this plate was slid all the way where this edge was lined up with the edge of the threads, that would mean the factory plate fuel plate has been slid. So I'm wondering if the fuel plate itself is a little worn, and that's why we got a little more power on the dyno. Maybe this was a factory freak. We'll see. So on this factory fuel plate, you see this witness outline where the washer under that bolt head was. But see this shiny mark here? It looks to me like somebody has slid or messed with this. I wonder if the factory maybe had uh, most messed with something on here or the dealership at some point because it definitely has two witness marks where it had been. So I'd say the fuel plate was not necessarily in the factory calibration because right there is where it was, but it could be slid back into there. You can see from the wear marks here. So I would guess some somebody's been in there. That must be why the horsepower is off a little different than what we think. Who did that, it's hard to say. Could have been the factory, could have been a dealer, could have been Joe Schmo, we don't know. And the old man can't remember he's had the truck too long. <laughs> okay, we're gonna work on this AFC housing. The first thing we need to do is get rid of this tamper screw. Underneath this little sheet metal cover, a lot of people call that the smoke screw. What that is is the pre-boost fueling. What it does is it sets how far this AFC foot is forward or rearward which this is a boost reference throttle stop so if you screw this in it moves the foot this way and gives you more fuel before there's boost if you're a hoonigan and you crank this all the way in you lose all of your boost reference fueling and you get full fuel all the time and it smokes that's not what we're trying to do we just want to take this off so that we can adjust it back a little bit because this uh this new afc foot this power driven one we're going to put in is modified so it can have more travel but we don't want to lose our smoke control, so we need to get in here and, and adjust this a little bit. is stuck only boost is supposed to be on this side so all this oil is oil that came out of the intake track or stuff that leaked by the seal on here because there's crankcase pressure in here it's pretty clean looking oil
right, now we're gonna get the Max Travel Kit installed. First thing we gotta look is, we did a 35 PSI spring, you can see that's longer and heavier. So uh, this is kinda how some of your smoke control comes. We got a little bit stiffer spring, controls the uh, AFC better. And because longer, it has more range of motion to control. Let's get this uh, new diaphragm. The old one on this truck looks okay, but I wanted to show you that a new one. These are kind of tear, but a new one's the same size from Bosch. It's just not all beat up from boost and oil from over the years. So we got this double washer back here. Oh, we need the spring first. Spring. Double washer. Move the foot forward so we got something to clamp on. Put the outer washer back on. You go just till it starts crushing out this just a little bit. So you know you're good and tight snug. Perfect. Got the power driven foot in here. See so compared to the stock one, it's a little bit modified on the profile. It's a little taller. So the governor arm doesn't get above it and do weird stuff. And uh, the barrel has been trimmed already so that it can travel, get a lot more travel on this foot than the factory one. I'm gonna put her back together. What we wanna this loose. Make it flush. Make it easier to install. All right, and also in the Max Travel Kit, we include these three three millimeter metric, five millimeter uh, socket cap screws to uh, replace the, the tamper screws. So instead of putting this screw back in that we ground a groove in, which you could use. We give you this nice, nice little metric bolt here to make it easy on you. For here, we have a short one that replaces the smoke screw cover here. And then we got a long one for the AFC housing to replace this one here, the rip off the AFC housing. So that's why there's three in there. Okay, so you need a three millimeter Allen wrench and a 10 millimeter open end wrench to adjust the AFC foot. We're gonna turn this in until we start getting tension on the AFC foot. Somewhere around there, I got tension. And then we're gonna go in, since this is a milder truck, we're gonna go in uh, two turns. One and a half to two turns is where most trucks. So there's a half, there's one, there's a half, there's two. Then you want to tighten this little jam nut. I don't usually put this tamper cover back on because sometimes you want to mess with the smoke screw more. So I don't even ever put this on any of my trucks. I usually throw this away. But you can put it back on if you want it to look factory stock again. We had this off so we could access the star wheel. Inside here is this little teeth thing. This a check. This changes the preload on the spring. So we back this off because the max travel spring is long enough. We don't need to preload it with the star wheel anymore. You can do some tuning with that, but generally you just back the star wheel all the way off with the supplied max travel spring because it's long enough that you don't need to add preload on the spring. It already has a bunch. That's 
done. Now let's take care of this little mess down here. Four hundred thousand miles. Nasty O ring. Sure it fits and then we're gonna glue it in with little right stuff. Just trying to glue the corners so the new gasket will stay in place. Let's put the sucker back on the truck. Normally there's a boot that holds this all on there. Obviously this boot's disintegrated on the shutdown solenoid. Now we gotta get the shutdown arm right here off. There's an eight millimeter right there. So now we're going to put the governor springs in. Um, we're going to do this without using a barring tool um, because, you know, that's how some guys at home can do it. So we're going to use our 7 8 ratchet or 7 8 socket on the alternator and we can turn the engine backwards. We're going to come down here and look in the governor housing that we've opened up. We've got to line it up. We'll wait for that governor to come into view. spring pack. It's starting to come into view now. We want it kind of centered so we can get at that nut in the middle a little bit more. Okay.
last time this came out in two pieces. This is the wear shim in the bottom. This always goes back in. This is the idle shim. This always goes back in. This is the very lowest piece. When I did the other half, this one didn't even come out with the magnet. It didn't fish enough. But that's always in there. Little wear shim, idle shim. Sometimes there's two or three of these little idle shims in there. They basically make the idle spring taller so that you get tension on the idle spring before you get tension on the main pack, which gives it a stronger idle. Which is good. Strong idle is good. Put these back in. Okay, now we gotta put the shutdown lever bracket back on this shutdown shaft. There's a half moon key that goes right there. If you lose that, your truck won't work right. It won't shut down. And it won't turn the fuel back on all the way. So we gotta make sure we don't lose that, but we also gotta make sure we install it. Put it in perfectly flat. And this has a cutaway in it right there. That cutaway's got to line up with the half moon key, otherwise you'll knock it out. Shut down lever goes this way. Go slow and make sure you don't knock the half moon key out. And that went in smooth. Okay. Better. Shut down. On. Perfect. All right, we put the shut down lever back on, which should be fun. The boot missing. Nice and clean, but that kind of clutch doesn't work very well. All right, so we just got the uh, fan and fan shroud off, and look at this this uh, dampener. It is puking its center out. This thing definitely needs a new dampener. Um, we don't usually keep stock dampeners on the shelf, so this thing's getting upgraded with a fluid dampener. All right, we're gonna advance the timing. The first thing we wanna do is get the engine to top dead center. So I'm gonna use my little trick over here on the alternator with my 7 8 my alternator with my uh, 7 8 socket. We're gonna bar the engine over backwards. I'm gonna watch till number six is in overlap. When number six is in overlap, right before I see the exhaust valve starting to go, I know I'm really close. Then I'm gonna reach under the pump. There's a plastic pin that sticks out and you can put pressure on it and it has a little pin that will engage the a hole in the cam gear when it's at top dead center. So I just want to get close before I try to reach my hand under there and push on it, especially on a greasy old engine like this. It's not comfortable to have your hand crammed in there. I'm just going to turn it over a little bit. In fact, I'm getting really close. I can see the intakes coming up on number six. So I'm going to push this uh, cam pin in and get it locked at TDC. Went, hear that click? 
Now we're locked at top dead center. Let's get this open. We gotta pop the injection pump gear loose now, and we gotta get our power driven timing kit magnetic degree wheel set up on the dampener here so that we can uh, do the timing. So I'm gonna do the timing on this truck the fast way. The super precise way is to get it top dead center. There's a pin on the side of the injection pump. You would then pin the pump because it should be centered in the window, assuming the truck's at stock timing. And then we can break the gear loose. We can back the engine up however many or actually we're gonna um, to advance the timing, we want to back the engine up, which will make the injection event happen earlier. That's so advancing is kind of weird. Long story short, if you use the alternator, you can't screw up. The alternator will only turn the engine backwards, which only allows you to advance the timing. You cannot retard the timing with the alternator unless you went clear around the circle. We're not talking about that. So the quick way, I know this truck's at stock timing. I'm just going to put the degree wheel and I centered the TDC zero mark right on the RPM pickup sensor right on this side of it. So to me, I'm using that as a pointer. If you want to be more thorough, you can get a wire under a bolt head and make a pointer, but I'm just doing this quick and dirty. So the TDC is lined up with that. So now all I'm going to do is pop the pump gear loose. And since this truck stock is, I didn't look at the data plate yet. Let's look at that. 12 or 13 degrees. So this truck's at 13 degrees. So to take it to seven or to take it to 20, we're going to advance at seven degrees. So we gotta get this oil pickup removed. Now we're going to take our 30 millimeter socket. You see this one's been through a lot. And the only thing that fits is injection pump gear. So you can see I've done this a few times. It's right on here. And this is standard thread. Righty tighty, lefty loosey. most of the way off all the way off you know don't drop it inside the cover there you're gonna have to go fishing for it okay you want to find the holes it looks like these ones are at about 12 and 6 they're straight across it just depends on where the gears lined up since we're at top dead center that's usually where they kind of end up we got the gear loose I put one of the bolts from the puller back in here just so it gives me a handle so I can manipulate this gear what I want to do is spray aerosol solvent brake parts cleaner carb cleaner starting fluid whatever you want in here we want to clean there's a tapered shaft underneath this gear I mean, we don't want oil in there otherwise it won't see this tight and you could slip the timing later going in the crankcase you know what you can change the oil it evaporates <laughs> slip timing sucks okay now this is loose let's back the engine up seven degrees and we'll be all set okay, we're gonna right. back it up about seven degrees oops we went too far 
worry, we can just go down on the dampener and turn it back forward with a 15 millimeter. It's all we could get and it started moving. Sixty, beautiful. Alright, now we're gonna take the front cover off because it's leaking oil like a sieve and this dampener needs to come off. So it would have been a little easier to do the timing with the front cover off because you can see what you're doing, but uh, we had to show you the way most guys are gonna do it. So let's get this front cover off. First off, we're gonna get the belt and the dampener off and then uh, all the front cover bolts. See that? That is a bad dampener. That rubber is supposed to be flush. This thing's caked, caked with grease. Look at that. Rubber's all squoze out. That's my word for squote, for when it's, you squeeze it in the past tense. It's squoze. Okay, we're gonna install the killer dowel pin kit. First, let's open it up and see what's in here. So we've got a new front main crank seal and a little installer tool. And we've got the tab and we've got an extra dowel pin in case, we, in case ours is falling out. So we don't need the dowel pin. Now, there's two styles of tab here. If you have a 1998 model, Sometimes there's an aluminum boss right where this dowel is located, so you need a little bit of a, of a pocket like this. Our style is flat, so we're going to use this flat tab. We're just going to use the bolt that came right out of it. We're going to put a little Loctite on it and uh, send it home. Pretty easy. Okay, so that's the killer dowel pin. That can rattle out because nothing retains it. It falls right on the cam gear there. The cam gear spins counterclockwise which makes the dowel pin fall out and get jammed right in here in the case and breaks the case. This one hasn't fallen yet, but I can see it's backed out quite a little ways. So we're going to tap it in and put our little tab over it. Send her home.
Okay, if you guys remember that stock dampener was uh, falling apart, it was disintegrating. So we're gonna upgrade with this fluid damper. Um, you also need this, you notice it has an SFI tag on it. When you go quicker than $11.99 at the drag strip, they start wanting an SFI rating on your dampener. So uh, we're gonna put this on uh, this truck, so we're gonna take it racing, but we actually needed it. The other one was coming apart and I didn't have any stock ones to put on there, so we figured we might as well upgrade it anyway, since we're turning up the power. Just like that, dude. All right, the torque specs like 101 foot pounds and uh, we put blue Loctite on there after we cleaned the threads, but it's too, the engine will start turning over on an old 400,000 mile, there's not enough, 400,000 mile engine, there's not enough compression to let you torque it that high. And so you can either have a buddy go wedge a screwdriver down in the uh, flex plate, or you can get a 200 foot pound little torque wrench and just send as hard as it'll, a little impact like this. And uh, it'll, it'll usually stay good if you, you send as hard as this thing can do it for a minute. They call it the Ugga Dugga Torque Method. Right, guys I want to tell you a quick tech tip about these power driven five ply airmed fiber reinforced boots a lot of boot manufacturers when they made a uh, these turbo hoses for your Cummins they just guessed and decided oh the intercooler is about three and a half inches and the pipes are three and they made the angle about 45 degrees because they slant a little bit we'll come a little closer here and look at this these are the factory boots we pulled off now if you look closely You'll see this is the passenger side one. This is the driver side. We know because it's still got the turbo discharge on here. Look at the angle of this boot versus the angle of the passenger side. So the factory made the passenger side boot have a steeper angle than the driver's side. Now let's look here at the power driven boots that complement this. Here is the driver side. See it's got less of an angle. And here is the passenger side. See how it's got a steeper angle. So these are perfect fitment. Also, these are not three and a half. These are about three and five eighths or 3.62 something inches. You know, our, uh, our guys got an exact fit. These fit well and uh, they won't blow up. We've ran these to 145 pounds of boost on a real engine on the chassis dyno, no failures yet. So that's why we're gonna upgrade these boots. So when you're thinking about upgrading the turbo hoses on your truck, sometimes it pays to, to uh, buy quality parts. Now in this case, we have one of the most affordable boots on the market anyway, so it's not even like you're paying extra, you're just gonna buy the right turbo hose or boot that fits your truck and actually will, will uh, last a lifetime. Thanks. <laughs>
If you guys remember when we started this process we left all the lines together so that they would reinstall easily. Check how easy it is to install these lines when we left them all together. line up for the plants. Okay, after you've had the fuel system all torn apart, and for us it's been a couple days, injectors, pumps been opened up, it's going to be a lot harder to prime the system. So you need to leave a couple lines loose. I like to leave lines that are easy to work on loose. So number three probably has the most access. I always leave number three loose. Number six is back there. It's hard. I'm going to tighten number six all the way right now because I don't I don't even care if that one bleeds slower than the others. We'll get all the bleeding done with one or two lines up here. So to me, I usually pick three and number two. Some guys like this one. It just depends on your turbo and the coolant lines. Number one's kind of hard because the lift bracket's here. So I usually leave, leave, leave three loose, sometimes number two. The other thing you can do, a lot of guys are scared, but you can make the engine run just on starting fluid. If you start it up with no turbo and the grid heater is disconnected so there's no chance of a backfire from the grid heater lighting off the ether, you can start a truck and just fog the intake as it's idling and keep it running and it will self prime really quickly with everything buttoned up tight. So you don't have to break lines loose to bleed it. It will self bleed as it runs but it's way faster if it's not trying to compress air when it's trying to push all the air out of lines. It's wide open. And uh, just, a, just a quick little tip when you're working on the fuel system on a, on a 12 valve Cummins. Okay, we're going to install the AFC Live next. The first and foremost is you want this in a convenient location where you can turn the knobs and see the gauge. But most important, you want to be able to hit that full power switch. So this has a nice uh, bracket that goes here, so it's pretty easy. We're just going to screw the bracket on, and there's a couple little thumb screws that holds the bracket. So it's almost like a trailer brake controller where you can pivot it and stuff. But in a race truck like this Papasaurus, I want this close so that I can hit that switch easily when I'm racing. So I'm probably going to temporarily mount it here. And when I put a ratchet shifter in here, I'm going to get this mounted on my shifter base so that right there by my shifting hand, it's easy for me to hit the full power. Because sometimes when you're like index racing or something, sometimes you get a bad launch, you need a little extra power and you can just flip that switch mid track, make up for your bad launch. And uh, you can just fender race the other guy to the finish line to try to get the wind without breaking out. All right, since this is an automatic, there's a perfect place where the clutch, um, the clutch slave cylinder would normally go, or the clutch master cylinder. So uh, we just uh, put a little 3 8 hole right through the uh, little plug there that's covering the clutch, the clutch pedal hole, and a perfect place to run the AFC live lines. The future will probably run a boost line through there, EGT probes, things like that. So if you have an automatic, it's really convenient. If you have a manual, um, I don't know. If you're smart enough to drive a manual, you're probably smart enough to find a way to route a line through the firewall. All right guys, so we've pulled these through the firewall. Now remember, the one with the white tape goes to the cylinder head. So we wanna route this up here, kinda of under the cowl. I'm gonna use some zip ties after I work it back here. Right here's a zip tie somebody else has used, so I'll just hook it through here. And this is running down to the cylinder head. Okay, so we're gonna route this line under the injection lines and into this quick connect fitting on the cylinder head here. 
if I can get it and keep my hands out of the camera view so you guys can see what I'm doing. Maybe not. Yeah, I got it. Do it. It's too The audio gun? Yep. Okay, so for this second one, there's no white line, but there is this quick vent valve. This makes the AFC Live work a lot better in a manual transmission trucks. Helps the air pressure bleed off faster, so it gives a little bit better smoke control. So what we're gonna do here is we need to cut a little section of line because we need a little splice part to go from here into this AFC one here. I'm just gonna cut off an inch or so of line my beautiful valve cover there. So putting this into the AFC housing fitting here, just insert it pretty easy. And really important, the white line goes towards the AFC housing, the white dot. If yours is rubbed off, you see there's little arrows. There's an arrow pointing the direction the air flows in and out. You want the airflow to go towards the AFC housing. Then we're just gonna hook this end in here. A couple zip ties, and we're done, dude. All right, this is the moment we've all been waiting for. First startup. Guys, if you've never worked on a truck, one of the most satisfying things you get to do after all your hard work is you have all this fear and anxiety. Did I do something wrong? Is it actually gonna start? And then when it starts up, and if it runs and purrs like a kitten, oh, the, it feels, it's the greatest thing in the world. So I'm gonna share this moment with you. We have no idea if this thing's gonna start up. Well, I uh, maybe cheated a little bit and, uh, and I primed it and I got the fuel out and it was starting to cough. So I think it's gonna start. We'll see how it goes. Check it out. Come on, baby, please start. Always want to check for leaks. Pretty smooth, huh? All right, guys, it runs. So we're gonna go slap this on the dyno. I'm so excited. I wanna see how much power we added. Now remember, we just put a small, you know, 500 horsepower fuel package on here. So it's nothing crazy, but I wanna see what this stock turbo will do and uh, with these mods and let's see if that stock tranny will hang in there. Fingers crossed, maybe it will, maybe it won't. But uh, I, I guarantee you with the governor springs and a little bit of fueling we did, this thing's at least gonna be able to do burnout, which is a huge win. All right guys, so as you can see, it did a good burnout as evidenced by the smoke still coming from under the hood. Let's just say Papa Source has never had the exhaust manifold that hot and a little bit of the oil and grits burning off it, but you know, it's just getting the pipes cleaned out. These old trucks, they got a lot of carbon buildup and a couple good burnouts gets them right on track for better ring seal and uh, you know, more fun. Uh, obviously we got to fix the one tire fire, this peg legger, Although it looks cool on the burnout, it's not cool if both tires aren't spinning. So I'm embarrassed to say that, yes, I couldn't get both to go. So we're gonna have to put a limited slip in here, which is on the docket anyway, because this is Papa Source, it's gonna be a race truck. But for now, let's actually go get it on the dyno and see what these uh, 
power mods did to the uh, performance of the truck. And then let's test a couple turbos out while we're there. Then we'll crank it up for some big power, maybe even a new engine. Thanks guys.